Well, hello and welcome to part three of our fruit growing series and today we'll be focusing on harvesting. Mm. We will be discussing when to harvest and what to do with your fruit treasures. Hopefully you can look out at your garden or patio today and can see all the fruit ready to harvest. My name is Lorna Baker and I am the Trellis Office Manager and with me today are my colleagues Joan Wilson who is our Trellis Project Advisor and Jenny Simpson, who is the Trellis Information and Fieldwork Coordinator. For those of you who don't know us, Trellis is the charity that supports people working in care, health, education and community settings to garden with their clients, especially those with no gardening knowledge or who are brushing up on forgotten skills. You can find out more about the support we offer to this sector and find links on our training and resources on the Trellis homepage. We have a special guest with us today, Norma Forbes, who is the horticulturalist team leader at Southston Small Holding at the Beald. Norma provides therapeutic work for a group of adults with learning disabilities. They have three polytunnels, a large vegetable garden, and some animals that they look after. As ever, the aim of these online sessions is to inspire you to have a goat gardening activities with your clients. We'll be sharing lots of ideas to st stimulate interest and interaction, and we'd love to hear about activities and techniques that you've tried or questions about how to do any of this. So we'll ask you to use the chat function throughout the session to type in questions and comments you'd like to make, and a member of staff will voice your questions at the end. During the Q&A discussion, you can also use the raise hand um, button, um, and we'll invite you to unmute and speak to access the raise hand button, it's just the three dots um, at, on the bottom of your screen um, and it's under reactions. We've also turned on subtitles today and again that's just the three dots and it's enable live transcript. The session today is around 60 minutes long. Um, there'll be several short videos, a question and answer and discussion with contribution from Norma. And at the close of the session, we'll invite you to complete our survey through a link in the chat to receive your free giveaway. I am now going to hand you over to Joan to um, start our videos. Okay, hello everybody. And um, just to echo what Lorna said, welcome to today's um, show. Um, and it is a bit of a show for those who have joined in before um, some of our live Zooms. I jump up to the table and we do, I do a practical demonstration actually at the tabletop. But during these growing series, what we've been doing is record, I've been filming um, some of my growing activity outside here and I've got several videos to show today, showing some of the fruits that I, picking up from where we left off the last time when we planted them up, watching how they've developed and how I've maybe had some better success than others. But anyway, we're going to start watching the films and we'll, we'll take it from there. So hopefully this is going to work beautifully for me. And we'll start with the first one. Fruit, glorious fruit. Back in January, we planted several fruit bushes into containers, including a blackberry, a patio raspberry, and a blueberry bush. Regular rainfall has helped ensure a bountiful harvest to date, strawberries in particular, but we'll take a closer look at the strawberry plants later. We planted a rhubarb root, which is slow to establish. It's recommended that the root is allowed to settle in for two years before harvesting its stems in any earnest. Luckily, I have a friendly supply that is keeping us in rhubarb pie in the meantime. You might recall the planting of the blackberry, the thornless compact variety Little Black Prince. This is the one that I potted up in January. It's doing fine, but doubt I'm getting much of a crop this year. At least it has stayed compact as described, unlike a second blackberry I planted, the variety Cularis Late, which I will need to train on to wires, but is producing oodles of flowers and developing fruits at present. 
The blueberry bush has done really well in its container of ericaceous compost and this plant has kept a neat shape and hasn't outgrown its allocated space. It's produced numerous bunches of berries and the blueberries ripen to the most beautiful colour of blue. And of course, it would be wrong of me not to have made a batch of blueberry muffins with the harvest. So raspberries now. In January, I planted up bare root raspberry canes. The all gold variety are doing well on their wigwam of canes. And raspberry Joan Jay is surprisingly tasty, given I picked it for its name alone and patio summer lovers is spreading like a bramble not at all like its pretty picture another one for me to relocate for next year but it is producing plenty of fruits and if you have no fruit in your own space take a wander on a country lane hedgerow fruits are looking very promising beat others to the brambles and cunningly collect in the crab apples. And regardless of which fruit you choose to harvest, you will engage your client groups in sensory stimulation, hand-eye coordination, along with social and culinary skills. Okay, so that's like the introductory one. And following on, I mentioned the strawberries. So we'll just jump straight into the strawberries and see where we go. From there. Growing strawberries in containers makes this popular and tasty growing activity more accessible and manageable for many. Most planted containers, whether it be a hanging basket or a lightweight trough on the patio, can be moved indoors if weather is problematic, ensuring that less able gardeners can continue to tend, harvest and enjoy, quite literally, the fruits of their efforts. During July and August, the strawberry plants will be making runners, long skinny tendrils with little clusters of leaf growth. It is now time to prepare for next year's bountiful crop. But first, a quick resume of growing this year's strawberry planter. Shop bought strawberry plants were potted up into a hanging basket in early May and flowers were the first sign of the tasty treats lying ahead. Regular watering, along with weekly feeding once fruits were setting, ensured a good crop. Growing strawberries in baskets and containers creates regular light activity, supporting and inspiring less able gardeners to engage through watering and feeding and harvesting fruits as they ripen. Pick the strawberries as soon as they are ripe to enjoy them at their best and to also encourage further fruiting. But be vigilant of the fusty ones. Remove immediately to avoid encouraging further mould or disease. And be creative. We use the hanging basket, but guttering provides a great hanging environment, preventing strawberries from lying too long on damp co compost which can make them fusty, also allowing air to circulate, keeping the plant more healthy and the hanging strawberries can access better light, which will help with fruiting. Unlike top fruit, such as apple and plums, strawberries have a short lifespan. After about three years, strawberry plants are exhausted 
and providing they're disease free, they should be retired to the compost heap. Fortunately, new plants are easily taken from older mother plants and the following clips show how to do this. Alongside producing strawberry fruits, the mother plant makes runners. These long tendril-like stems form little clusters of leafy growth along their length, which can be planted up and grown on to supplement or replace the older strawberry plants. To make these new strawberry plants, we need the mother plant with its runners still attached, some general purpose compost and some small pots. These are nine centimetre size ones and a container to hold the pots in. Some U-shaped wires such as hairpins or these fence staples or bend some fine wires yourself. We don't cut the runner from the mother plant just yet. These runners are in a wee bit of a fine coat, so I'll unravel them before I go any further. Run your fingers along the skinny runner stem and choose a healthy, strong leaf cluster. And break up any lumpy bits in the compost before filling one of the little pots full with compost. Take the leaf cluster and place it on top of the compost and pin it firmly to the compost surface with a U-shaped wire. Pin the wires either side of the stem. And repeat again. Consider having the little pots pre-filled with compost. Removing one element of the chain of activities can support those less confident to participate and enjoy the success. This runner has several new clusters. I'm choosing the strongest and closest one to the mother plant. The runners must stay attached to the mother plant until the new baby plants make their own roots. I've got my tray here of baby plants and the mother plant adjacent. I'm going to snip off the runners that I've not used and any other wee bits of trailing stem that will only use up energy that I'd prefer to be directed to the baby plants to help them make their roots. Give them a good water and also over the next few weeks to ensure good root growth. Continue watering the mother plant also, removing any more fruits that might be produced as they ripen. And don't forget to check the wires are still giving a good contact with the compost. Weather conditions were perfect. It was warm and dry, which meant almost daily watering of the runners in their pots. But after three and a bit weeks, the telltale sign of white thread-like roots were peeping out the bottoms of the pots. Carefully squeeze the compost and new roots out of the pots 
and this closer inspection reveals that the young runner plants have a sufficient root system to allow them to be detached from their mother plant. Remove the wire pins and use sharp scissors and snip the runner off close to the newly established young plant. Snip off that runner fully from the mother plant and then snip off any new runners that may be growing on the young plant also. You want the young plant to keep all of its energy for its main purposes of maintaining a good root system, top leafy growth and enough energy in reserve for the start of fruit production next year. Don't allow the plants to dry out completely but don't overwater as we head into autumn and through winter. Strawberry plants are hardy for our climate, but given these young plants' tender age, overwinter them in a frost-free place and cover with a layer of garden fleece if extreme cold is forecast. Before we know it, it will be early spring and we can pot on these young strawberry plants into baskets and containers, raised beds, almost anywhere and once again look forward to their juicy fruits. Okay, so those strawberry runners that you saw me putting into those little pots and then they overwintered, they were done last year, this time last year I did that video. So they overwintered last, when was that, 21? Winter of 21 into 22. And I potted them on into bigger pots, like this one here. And this is one of those um, little uh, strawberry runners that I took last year. And I've just brought it in just to show you how many babies that particular one has made as well. Now, I could take um, some really nice, healthy looking little uh, leafy growth um, nodes here that I could do the exact same thing, pin them down into compost and make new plants. But because this is only a one-year-old plant, what I'm going to do is actually just cut off all these runners straight where it comes out of this now, the mother plant, and let it just conserve all this energy to bulk up. And next year, it's going to give me even more um, fruits. Now, this particular variety is Symphony, and I think it's a really nice strawberry, nice tasting strawberry and one that does well here in the west coast of Scotland. Um, so I'm keen to keep this one and I will take runners new plants from it next year but the amount of strawberries I actually left this just to prove that I got strawberries off of it as well this year. I get loads of strawberries off of all those little strawberry plant flips that I took last year. So I just wanted to show you how easy it is to grow strawberries and you don't need a lot of space, lots of little pots all over the place, on walls, on hanging baskets and makes it really accessible for many people to enjoy growing and eating strawberries. Okay, next video I would like to share is... Um, we are right now. Black currants, here we go. Black currants. They've produced a really good crop for me this year with plenty of plump fruits ripe for the picking. Black currants produce most of their fruits on new shoots that grew the previous year. And a typical bush will have older stems producing fruits alongside newer stems preparing to grow fruits next year. To maintain a healthy cropping plant, it's really good practice to annually remove the older stems, generating space for new stems to develop, ensuring a continuum of older stems being replaced by newer, more productive stems. And pruning of black currants can be done in summertime after fruiting or in midwinter in preparation for new spring growth. And always use a sharp pair of secateurs to ensure a clean cut to maintain plant health. When pruning, always remove crossing stems to prevent the two stems rubbing and eventually being damaged. If neither stem is already damaged, 
Choose the older, more inward facing stem to maintain an open branched shaped shrub, allowing light and air to circulate the center of the plant. Prune close to the end of the stem where it has branched off from another stem. The newer, lighter coloured brown stem to the front of the removed, darker brown stem has been saved to further develop and produce fruits next summer. And once well, well established, it's good practice to annually remove a third of the oldest stems at ground level to encourage new stems to grow upwards and develop to produce fruit the next again summer. Cut at an angle to allow rainwater to run off the cut, avoiding potential damage to the plant. The shrub is now less congested with the darker brown woodier stems removed. Or prune out an entire older stem complete with fruits attached. Take it indoors and remove the berries in the comfort of the kitchen, avoiding any bending or kneeling. Harvesting and pruning has now been completed in the one task. If growing black currants in a container, top up compost levels if they are reduced. This will also encourage the development of new stems from the base of the plant. So what to do with the bounty of berries? Try making jam, summer puddings, cordial or something stronger, sorbet, to name a few. But my favourite is to make a crumble with rhubarb. Stew the rhubarb, then gently mix in the topped and tailed black currants. Top with a crunchy demerara crumble topping and serve warm with vanilla ice cream. Yummy. Okay, now I have to say that um, that crumble, rhubarb and black currant crumble is the best ever. Absolutely. And I never admitted that I actually have custard and cream with the ice cream, but I didn't want to <laughs> put that in, you know, evidence there. So... I mentioned sharp secateurs um, when you're pruning the, the stems. It's for good health and good safety in the garden. If your, uh, if your secateurs are kept sharp, there will be less damage done because the, the, the secateurs will actually have a clean cutting action. Sharpening your secateurs is quite a skilled job and it's something that I don't um, do. I just take mine to a local the lawnmower guy and they do they've got tools to to sharpen your secateurs with and your other um loppers and things like that but perhaps norma has um some tips that she can share with us later on um on the best way to prune uh, to sharpen uh, tools like that but we can ask norma that later on but what i do do is keep my secateurs clean if you keep your secateurs clean then the chances of um transferring any disease among the plants is kept to a minimum. So I've got some secateurs here. Um, these are gardenia ones that I find are really nice. They've got a wee dial here that means you can adjust to suit the hand size of the, the person that's gardening. So if you've got tiny wee hands, you turn it around to the little hand. Oops and it only opens a little way or if you've got big hands like me you can turn it around and the hand though it opens far wider i'll just put it back into the center so best way to clean your secateurs is clean them after every gardening activity or in between um plant types if that makes sense to you um now don't do the full clean that i'm about to do just give them a wash down with um some water and um some kitchen roll in between working with plant types but to clean them properly at the end of the day just get something like a, a wee washing up scoury thing and you're just let's see the best way to demonstrate this so you can see what i'm doing I'm just giving us rubbing off any kind of dried on leaves or woody material that might have got stuck in there, taking the worst of it off. And this sort of abrasive action 
is also, you maybe find that rust builds up in your secateurs. This is just taking away any excess buildup that could result in rust. So that's that wee bit done. We keep our secateurs oiled, all the moving parts, just a bit like your car, um, they need to be kept oiled to keep them nicely lubricated. Now, any type of oil do, WD-40 or that wee squirty can that my dad always has one in his hut and in the garage that he squirts on everything. I don't have one of them, but I do have a walnut oil that I no longer use in cooking um, that does the exact same job. So don't throw anything out. Everything has another use as far as I'm concerned. So if I just put a wee drop of the, oh my goodness, did you see that? Thankfully that wasn't my laptop. Oh, anyway, let's wipe that up off my desk there. Right, so a wee bit of um, oil onto my cloth. And I'm just going to wiggle it in round about all these moving parts. If you've got one of those wee oil cans, you would just like kind of squirt it on. But this does the same job. Just be careful because the blades are open and you don't want to cause any accidental damage. So I'm just wiggling a wee bit in there and I'm just going to put a little drop of oil onto the actual blades. Again, be careful with this. Hold them up a bit, Joan. Oh, sorry. That's it. <laughs> concentrating on what I'm doing there, in case I didn't put my fingers off. Right, so I'm just wiggling, you can see I'm not being terribly thorough, but the, the oily cloth is just, oops, is just in, in about everything. If you accidentally get any oil on the handles, I would make sure you wash that off because you don't want the next person coming along and slipping, their hand slipping on the oil. And with the drier end of the cloth, I'm just taking off any excess oil. And you can maybe see how much cleaner the secateurs look already. And that is how I clean my secateurs after every gardening activity. It doesn't take a long time, but it's really good practice to get into the habit. Now, these are bypass secateurs. These are the kind that I prefer to work with. They work like scissors where the two blades actually cross one another. The silver one you'll see actually disappears behind the black one. That gives a, a, a cleaner cut, let's say, and is the type of secateur that I would recommend. If you're going to go out and invest in a pair, go for the, the bypass secateurs. Now, I don't have a pair of anvil secateurs, but Jenny does have. And Jenny, if you can hold up your secateurs, you're probably going to have to um, spotlight yourself so we can see your secateur. Right, okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'll carefully move my oil. Okay. Here we go. I have a pair of uh, what you called anvil secateurs. So if I hold them at an angle, can you see that the blade just touches the other one? Yeah. So they, they meet together like that. Yeah. yeah. So anvil secateurs do the exact same job as the bypass that I've got, but instead of that nice clean cutting action that the by uh, bypass do, Jenny's anvil are more of a crushing action, which is fine for, um, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you don't keep them sharp and have a good firm um, crush mm. down on top of that anvil, you can actually start to tear the, the wood that you've just cut. And if you tear it, you can have wee sort of strandy, you want a nice clean cut, as opposed to like a raggy edge. If you've got a raggy edge, there's more chance that some disease or infection can get in there. So anvil sectors, nothing wrong with them, but if you've got the choice, go with the, the bypass ones. And while we're talking about pruning, we're just going to, Jenny's got a lovely pair of scissors there that would be great for deadheading plants. And we've not mentioned deadheading. Deadheading is all about just cutting off little flower heads to ensure more flowers are produced on your annual, your summer flowering plants. So Jenny, do you want to talk through your scissors? My scissors, yeah. Just, um, sorry, just quickly on these, um, back on these anvil ones. These are actually made of plastic, so they're very, very light. 
it's not good for the planet, but it's very, very light. If you have difficulty holding heavy, you know, if you've got weak um, joints, weak wrists, it's very, very easy to hold them. So it might be useful for some client groups. Yeah. Um, and this one's got a kind of ratchet on. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't have a strong grip, you can kind of, because I find this is quite good for quite wide branches, you can kind of click, they sort of, I don't know, they sort of grip onto the, the branch and then you go click, click, and it, it's less, it's easier to squeeze the handles together, is what I mean. So uh, maybe with people with weak, weak grip, it's, it's a possibility. Um, anyway, but these are also for people with, with a weaker grip or um, no grip. These are uh, made by an organisation called PETA, P-E-T-A, and they are easy use scissors and um, they're very easy to use. If I just show you, you can, with the lightest of grips, you can squeeze them together. <clears throat> We're going to share a link with you later um, in the follow up email, but it they produce, PETA produced lots of scissors like this, so you don't have to have a good grip to use them. They're nice and sharp, so they're good for deadheading flowers if you want to. Um, you know, you don't need to use a pair of secateurs. And they come in different sizes, so that was quite a big pair. I've got this dinky little mini pair here that are lovely. They come with a guard, come with a guard as well. So they're just very easy to use if you want to. These would be lovely for deadheading if you didn't want to use your hands and you wanted to be very precise. Um, so these are lovely and sharp. They also have desk mounted scissors. So you don't have to be able to grip like that. You can just, they're mounted, if you imagine they're mounted on the desk and all you have to do is press down on the top and the scissors work. So it's worthwhile looking at if you have um, clients who need a bit of extra assistance to do cutting of any sort, not necessarily out in the garden, um, but these scissors might be an option. So they're called PETA Easy Grip and uh, they're quite quite useful in some situations. Back to Joan, thanks. Great, okay. okay. that's good, thank you Jenny. Right, okay, another video coming up. Um, wait till we find it again. What one are we at? Uh, gooseberries, we're at gooseberries now, oops. Here we go. Hello, and welcome to my gooseberry growing story. Gooseberries are one of the easiest soft roots to grow, generally thriving on little care. Some decent soil or compost, good light, and they will literally do the rest themselves. I'd really love to grow them in a fruit cage, but I don't have that luxury. But they are good for small garden spaces as they can be container grown and trained upwards, saving valuable space. And although fan training requires less space, this shape lets more sunlight in, making for more riper berries and makes picking the juicy fruits easier as the stems are quite thorny. You could perhaps make a fan shape against an existing freestanding trellis or structure, such as a boundary wall or fence. And although not crucial, a south facing spot would be perfect. The following shows a young gooseberry bush that was grown in a container for this its first growing season, which has fruited well growing in its large pot. However, for next year I'm keeping it in its pot, but I'm going to train it along wires into a fan shape, saving some space and hopefully eliminating the thorny nips when picking the fruits next year. So here it is. I can't really believe how much growth it has put on over the past few months. I feel though it's a bit too sprawly for where I want to grow it, hence my attempt now at fan training it up a post and wire structure. For my frame to chain the stems up, I attached three lengths of wire between two sturdy fence posts. The first wire was 35 centimetres from the ground, allowing enough space for the plant's container to sit beneath this wire. The second wire was spaced approximately 30 centimetres above the first, and the third wire was roughly 45 centimetres above the second. The wire spacing is not crucial, but it's important that the wires are pulled taut to ensure a rigid support for the plant. 
I placed the large pots that the plant had already been growing in directly below the bottom wire and roughly spread the stems into a fan shape up against the wires. Now, I only want to keep six stems in total, so I identified the healthiest and best placed ones to make my fan shape. I used sharp secateurs and removed the front facing stems, cutting at an angle across the stem as close to the base of the stem as I could get. Removing all of these forward facing stems quickly reduced the number remaining to choose my preferred six from. I then removed the stems that were crossing one another at the base of the plant as I want this area in particular clutter free as this will help with the plant's overall health as it will deter build up of an environment that will attract pests and disease. I use string to tie the stems onto the wires. Tie the string onto the wire first of all to ensure that the string itself is taut and secure. Then tie the string ends around the plant stems. Tight enough that the stem doesn't flap and rub, but loose enough that the stem's bark is not going to be damaged as the stem continues to grow. Once the six stems were tied in place, they were pruned down to where they met a wire, cutting just above a leaf. The plant will put on growth over the next few weeks before it hunkers down for the winter. I'll revisit it during the winter months to do a little more pruning if required to ensure good shape and good fruiting making for next year. And here is the fruit bush as it stands now with the six stems in the fan shape, each stem pruned to the height of a wire and tied on with string. And the area around the base of the stems is now clutter free. So, as I wait in anticipation of an even bigger and juicier but less jaggier crop next year, I'm enjoying the fruits of my gooseberry bushes labour from this summer. Thank you for watching. Okay, so that's that's it. Um, that's the my success or not so much success um, in my fruit garden this year. Raspberries um, have done well. They, all those photos were taken a good um, three, four weeks ago. So raspberries have been great. I um, can't believe how many raspberries I did get off the plants given they were so young. Um, so looking forward to, I'll be uh, capturing the, the pruning of those raspberries and whatnot during the winter time when we come round to doing that along with the blueberries and um, but blueberries were a huge success in fact I've actually got more blueberries out there needing to to be harvested so that's a job for the weekend also so I hope you enjoyed watching them and um so um Lorna Jenny questions thanks very much <laughs> the, the muffins and the crumble looked amazing um, so we are now going to do our q &A session. So if you want to raise your hand um, and then Jenny will ask you to unmute and ask your question or feel free to put it in the chat box. So I'm now going to hand over to Jenny to start the q &A. Oh, thanks very much, Lorna and Joan. Well, no questions yet in the queue. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Yes. Do you have any advice, uh, Joan, and uh, also to Norma here, because um, we're, we've got two people here that are keen growers. Do you have any advice on which soft fruits to grow in a fruit cage for easy maintenance? So some easy maintenance fruits in a fruit cage. Any, any ideas? Well, my my suggestion would be, regardless of how easy or difficult it is, is grow something that you'll eat. Um, red currants are dead easy to grow. They're one of the easiest to grow. You don't really have to do much pruning for them. They seem to produce an abundance of fruits in Scotland, quite the thing. But if you don't eat red currants, don't grow them because <laughs> regardless of how little maintenance is involved, it's a waste of space and it's a waste of, of a fruit. So if you like strawberries, grow strawberries. If you like raspberries, grow raspberries, Because, but autumn fruiting raspberries because they're the easiest ones to look after because you cut them down to ground level in the winter time, 
they put on new growth and they actually put fruit on that new growth this year. Then you cut them down the winter time and it repeats the cycle. Um, so raspberries, blueberries, absolutely. Blueberries. Um, I can't believe how many blueberries I've got off of that plant um, this year through minimal care. So they would be my they would be my choice because I love raspberries, strawberries and blueberries. Gooseberries I love as well. So gooseberries, but they're really, really um, jaggy to pick. Um, but again, they require little care. Yeah. Norma, do you have any preferred fruits? Um, I, I totally agree with all the ones that you, you've uh, gone ahead with there. And very much the ones you like, you should be growing. Um, I'm just thinking in, in a fruit cage situation, um, be aware of how much uh, black currants, especially if you're growing them, how much they grow, um, because they can very quickly outgrow an area. You think you've given them plenty of room, but they, they will get quite big. Um, even with pruning, they, they get quite large. And to make sure that you don't sort of, uh, if you have too many bushes in your cage, that you have nothing but the one fruit. So make sure that you've got enough room. Um, also, the, the uh, blueberries, um, a lot will depend on your soil type. Um, where I live um, in Spitalfield in Perthshire has very sandy soil and I grow fantastic blueberries. Um, I have to keep them well uh, caged off from the blackbirds because I've even seen them jumping on the top of the nets mm. to try and get, get down to them. Whereas here where I work at Black Ruthven, we, we have a clay soil and they really don't grow terribly well, even though I have put ericaceous compost at the roots. They don't grow nearly as well. They actually are better in tubs here. Um, they, they're heavier clay soil. They don't like so much at all. Um, they prefer the sandy soil. So uh, perhaps uh, you might have a wee look at what soil you're putting the, the fruits in. It makes a difference to how well they thrive. Um, as I say, uh, if you can get a cage, terrific. If you can't, Think of getting a frame and putting a, a net over it, which is a cheaper option. That's great. Uh, has anybody got any tips on bugs on um, gooseberries at all? That oh, eat the yeah. gooseberry leaves. Do we know anything about them? <laughs> well, well, you're so flat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, go, go on. <laughs> Uh, we find that our worst enemy here is the sawfly for the gooseberries mm -hmm. and uh, that tends to be a labour of love, going and checking them every other day when it's early in the season and just picking them off. Uh, we find that that's the easiest way. If we cover them with an Enviromesh to stop the bugs going on them, it tends to affect the pollination. Right. and you don't get so many fruits so it's just a case of being vigilant and picking the beasties off I don't know how Joan deals with that perhaps she'll let us know yeah no I wasn't actually bothered this year and I don't well, know this I, fine. <laughs> um so I'm I was I'm quite um I can't believe how healthy my plant was given um the little care that I gave it. Um, but yeah, if you see these bugs, just pick them off. It's the easiest way of dealing with it. And then you're not using any pesticides that might bring other problems along. And also if you're using pesticides on fruit bushes, you've got to be really careful because you've got to make sure there's X number of weeks have passed before you can actually harvest the fruits and eat them. So the best policy is just don't use them and then you know that the fruit is always safe to if somebody accident not accidentally if someone unbeknown is passing through and they see the juicy fruit and they take it you know that it's safe to eat um, and you might have lost some leaves to the soft fly but at least you know that the the plant is a safe plant yeah absolutely um, I wonder if I could open up, sort of just throw a question out to the whole group there and maybe you can share with us what fruit grows well with you. So if you can uh, put, pop your hand up or unmute yourselves and tell us what fruit grows well with you, because we've got people here from all over the country and it'd be really interesting to know what you've tried or if you haven't tried what you'd like to try. <laughs> Anybody there? Ollie, Ollie, you're up in the... Western Isles, do you have fruit growing with you or is that something you're aspiring to do? 
Yeah, we've got lots growing. Lots of strawberries, black currants, and gooseberries. So that was very interesting. And the rhubarb is probably our most popular thing. But we also grow lots and lots of other things. So it, it means that many plants um, fight for our attention. <laughs> so it's great to have some some detailed input there. We don't don't often prune our black currants. We let let the birds do the job, and the wind does a lot of pruning for us. Um, I think our most popular fruit, though, this year has been alpine strawberries. Oh. So a lot uh, more time consuming to pick, but by far the sweetest. Mm. And yeah, I think what we've probably all got in common is pests and disease and weather, etc. And uh, for, for us here, the biggest challenge is usually the wind, although it's flat calm today, it's very unusual. Um, pests and diseases we don't have too much problem with uh, other than birds so we use various fish farm netting and all sorts of things temporary cages if you like and um, uh, sorry the grown materials I was just distracted by 18 year olds appearing <laughs> and um, uh, growing materials yeah so the, the soil structure I was particularly interested in Norma, you say you've got a clay soil. It's, it's a free draining clay, yes, but it's clay. Because uh -huh. here our, our um, topsoil in the in the community garden is very sandy. We're we're right beside the macher, so it's mm -hmm. very alkaline. But we've got a, a convenient stables on site, so we've got masses of horse manure and um, seaweed. Seaweed we spread every year as well. Mm -hmm. So I was particularly interested in whether or not different currant bushes and gooseberries prefer different soils. So that was very interesting. I grow all my fruit is in general. All my fruit are in pots, apart from the black currants that are growing in the ground, um, and that's a um, free draining clay soil. I would describe the black currant mm -hmm. soil. The only ericaceous um, compost in pots is for my blueberries. So mm -hmm. everything else was in general purpose, middle of the road stuff, um, with the blueberries being very specifically um, mm -hmm. kept to ericaceous compost. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. We've been trialling a, a new peat-free compost this year, um, which is supposed to be optimal for potato growing. So they mm -hmm. love it. Uh, but the strawberry propagation we've done, so the, the little tendrils you were demonstrating there in the in the video, they seem to not like it at all. But that uh, that's common of a lot of the crops we've tried in it. So um, I wonder if that can tell us we've not done any laboratory testing or anything on this on this new compost. But it seems that most of the fruits we've tried in it don't like it. Mm. Uh, I'm wondering if we could maybe add add something that we have, whether it's sand, manure, compost, uh, our own compost. We could mix it in as well, or the the seaweed that might make it a bit more friendly to to fruit. Is it quite rough? The compost. It's really rough. Yeah, it's not. It wouldn't be good for seed sowing. So it's mostly um, split perennials that we've used and cuttings and tendrils strawberries etc. I wonder if it's because because of the roughness this seems to be the general kind of observation of these peat-free composts. If you've got your own, um, the horse manure is brilliant for adding to your compost, um, it's just it's just lovely. Um, I think I would be getting as much of your sort of broken down horse manure, do you put that into your compost heap at the moment? Is that well, no, we've got such such large quantities. We keep them separate. We've got a huge composting bank. We we use the uh, recycled fish tanks, so they're plastic, okay. and they they're really quick to rot. So we've got a lot of our own compost. It's it, it's interesting you say that with the texture because that hadn't really occurred to me as being problematic because mm -hmm. we haven't used it for uh, seed propagation. Yeah. So I perhaps would... sorry sorry no keep going. Um, perhaps a mix of our own compost. Maybe we could sieve it or something if the 
if the the texture might be too yeah. rough i think it's mm. the structure and the texture is just too gritty too not gritty too coarse you know lumpy mm. Um, I would be interested in doing a sort of an experiment with your horse manure, taking some of your compost heap that you're making just now and having a, a separate one and adding lots of the horse manure to that to have a sort of horse based, horse manure based compost yeah. and mix that through your peat free compost and then do a separate experiment just adding it in the peat free mix with your compost. I love that suggestion. Thank you. Okay. And uh, mostly, yeah, mostly the, the manure is mm -hmm. by the barrow load. So it's yeah. straight into the, the dark beds and spread also over the beds at winter. Uh, yeah. But uh, that's like, great. Yeah, I would mix it through, get get on that job today, this afternoon. Those 18 year olds, get them on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's only one. There's another one to, to get out morning. <laughs> 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 yeah we've got a lot of young volunteers though so that's that's a great job for them yeah and it breaks down quite quickly the horse manure so it would be interesting you must feed back to us how you get on that's a really interesting um yeah um we have so much so we always have uh we've actually got two big manure clamps so one is ready to go it's had more than 12 months it's completely rotted through Okay. So it's it's easy just to to mix through the compost. Yeah. Norma, you'll use um, animal manure. Yes. Manure. Yep. Yes. Well, it's a, we we're lucky. We've got such a mix of of animal manures. We've got the alpaca, pig, uh, goat, hen, uh, and goose compost. Um, but our our peat free compost tends to be more the coir based rather than the bark based. Um, so I'm just wondering if the, the actual peat-free base um, is maybe a bit too chunky um, for what they're, they're looking to grow the fruit from. Um, but we, we tend to um, put, only put the manure through things that are more greedy, things like oh, the onion family, um, squashes, uh, courgettes, things that they need a bit more feeding. Um, when we're, we're transplanting things like uh, strawberries and such, we would keep to just more the coir base um, rather than put in uh, the extra oomph that that would, uh, but I'd like to have some seaweed. That sounds a really good mix. I would have thought that, but because it's slow release, it might it might be better for the fruit, uh, young fruit trees or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I don't know exactly what the peat free compost is because we've we've seen no breakdown of it. It was just an enormous donation given to us. Ah, um, that always the best. Think, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, my first. <laughs> first thought was bark because also it's not good uh -huh. at moisture retaining the moisture it seems to dry a lot quicker than any other compost uh -huh. so it's probably part bark based yeah. going on on touch alone perhaps you could get some you know you get the bricks of coir that you could just that you can rehydrate and just add into it might free it up a wee bit and it might be that the water's getting too much moisture retention there uh-huh Great. I'm, I'm loving that we got on straight onto compost. <laughs> We've also got um, chicken manure here, but that's from my own garden, but that's proper rocket fuel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That really yeah. Just the job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. I think we're um, considering having a, having a, a sort of um, a bigger, uh, a closer look at compost uh, perhaps in the springtime because it's such a popular subject every time we we cover it we get lots and lots <laughs> of interest so uh, we'll be coming back to that one at another time um i wonder if i could ask hannah to unmute um she's based i think she's over in glasgow and she's got some observations about um fruit in community gardens in the west coast hannah are you able to speak to us today are you there I know she's in a library today, so maybe she's oh, not. Oh, maybe she can't. She sent us a message. Or well, I'll read it out to you. Um, she says she's not 
got any access to uh, a growing space, but um, she said that fruits have been growing well in community gar uh, gardens around Glasgow. Um, so there's lots of community spaces on the south side of Glasgow, and they've been enjoying picking raspberries, blackberries, uh, red and black currants, strawberries and gooseberries. So they seem to have the full uh, quota there. Um, it's a couple of new messages there. Yeah, so she can't uh, speak to us because she's in the library, unfortunately. <laughs> she says, thanks for another lively and informative workshop. Thanks very much, Hannah. Please join us again. It's lovely to have you have you here with us. Uh, does anyone else want to share anything about their, fruit, about their fruit growing or any observations about compost or anything else that you'd like to bring up today? Could I just raise, it's Lorna. Hi, Lorna. Oh, yeah. Um, I, well, I'm also just outside Glasgow. So, but um, yes, for ours, is very, very definitely clay, heavy clay. I could make bricks, okay. quite literally. The seed bombs, I don't need to collect clay. If anybody wants some, <laughs> really, <laughs> I can ship it out for you. But yeah, everything, absolutely everything we do have to, has to be built in raised beds to the point that we've had to move the rhubarb three times and build even wow. bigger raised beds because it is that clay soil. But yeah, I mean, we've got rhubarb, gooseberries, tayberries. They've mm -hmm. gone really, really well. All, but all again, all in raised beds and all re, re back feeding with the composting system that you guys suggested and set up. But yeah, that it, you have to rethink how you do the garden sure. to be able to make it accessible because everything's got to be raised quite considerably. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and what we've purposely done also is planted um, any native wild trees to try and absorb some water because it, it, it's not free draining at all. <laughs> well, that's great. So you've really sort of um, used the the um, attributes of your site to dictate, so, well, not dictate, but you've um, planted to in order to mitigate some of those things. And, yeah, we've had to. We've had, but I mean, it's worked because yeah. the yeah. harvest has been quite remarkable, which is which is wonderful to see. Yeah. But yes, so uh, you you have to work with what you've got. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, who are you working with, Lorna? What kind of uh, group are you working with? I've got a full mixed ability, so they're, they're, I'm neighbourhood network, so they're a network within all in their own area, so the concept is that they peer support, so this is in community gardens, it's in the back of somebody's property, it's even, uh, you know, plants on the side of the windowsill from really small gardens to big community, and, we've, and everything in between, um, yeah. Well, yeah, so really some cool. from just the little small pots of herbs on the window ledge that we can use all the time. And I loved, I followed the, so you, you just put them just outside and brush past uh -huh. to the big community space. So, yeah. Oh, that's lovely to hear. Fantastic. Oh, well, well, power to your growing elbows there. That's lovely. <laughs> well. <laughs> That's great. Well, we'll hear more from you if, uh, next time you're along and uh, throughout the seasons. It'll be lovely to follow what you're doing. So has anyone else got anything they'd like to share with us today? Um, that's lovely. Um, Norma, I'm just wondering if you could, could you tell us a bit about the group that you work with and what kind of fruits you grow in your, in your, at Southton? You've touched, yes, on, you've touched on the blueberries and a couple of other things, but be great to know yes. to no extent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, my group is a, a group of adults with learning disabilities, mainly uh, people with uh, Down syndrome and people with autism. And they're all over 18 um, and from age range from uh, uh, just over 18 um, to our, in their mid 40s. Um, we've been uh, operating for over 20 years here. I personally have been here 18 years 
My goodness, it doesn't seem that. <laughs> Sometimes it does. And we uh, have a large garden. We actually, as an update, Jenny, it's a wee while since you've been here. We are now erecting our sixth polytunnel. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> one, of, one of which is a polycarbonate one and which we now heat uh, in the early part of the year. So yeah. we're, we're, we're really expanding. Uh, quite a bit. Um, we don't specialise in fruit growing, um, mainly because it is the time it takes to pick that can be more of an issue. Um, we, we operate a weekly vegetable box scheme and everything is picked on the day that the vegetable boxes go out, which we did have raspberries uh, at one point, but when it was in season, it took so long to pick them that we were really struggling to get the boxes out. So we, we, they, they then got a root disease, um, which meant that they, they naturally, I'm afraid, died off anyway. Uh -huh. So we, but we found that they took too long to pick to be useful yeah, yeah. for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we couldn't pick them earlier the day before because they, they tended to go a bit mushy. Mm -hmm. So now we have uh, black currants, red currants, strawberries, um, gooseberries, uh, a small amount of, of blueberries. And they tend, we, we can pick them, not so much the strawberries, but the other currants, etc. We can pick them the day before, which helps us in, in that way. Um, Pruning the black currants is always a bit of an issue. Um, the timing, <laughs> remember to get your timings right. Um, but we're getting better at it. At one time, they would kind of skip a couple of years and then have to go in there with machetes, <laughs> practically. <laughs> but um, it's, and it's always a fun time. What we love about it is it's a fun time uh, because it's the one thing that everybody likes to pick and eat. Although I have a rule with the strawberries, you have to whistle while you pick strawberries because <laughs> that way you can't be eating them. <laughs> we are lucky enough that we have a large orchard just down the road uh, on the estate and we tend to uh, go in there after the gardener is collected for the estate and we glean the apple trees and plum trees there. But we are now thinking of creating our own small orchard, um, which we're, we're planning in the next few years. Uh, again, it's a fun time. Uh, everybody enjoys it. And it's that, that sort of end of summer, lovely feel when you go picking the apples. We all wear crash helmets. <laughs> We've got hard hats because they're big trees and it's it's serious. Some of these cooking apples are like missiles when they come down. So to keep our team healthy, we've got them. We also have long poles with little pickers on the top of them to make it easier. So uh, fruit's a good thing to have. It's a fun thing to grow. <laughs> that sounds excellent fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. I don't know. Well, that's it. Well, we should all get along to our nearest orchard to uh, <laughs> do a bit of apple gleaning. That sounds brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Remember your hard hat. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, do your hard hat. <laughs> I think that's all our questions today. Back to Lorna. So thank you all very much for your contributions today and a very uh, big thank you to Joan, Jenny and our special guest, Norma. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our next session, which is on the 29th of September at 10.30. And it's Draw Along with Laura Kipage Art, and it's learn how to draw in this session and have a, um, a goat sketching a colourful seasonal garden flipper. It's for all abilities. Um, meanwhile, visit our YouTube channel for all of the recordings of our live Zooms and some how-to videos. You can try our seasonal gardening online training for free and download some activity sheets. Um, just visit our website for more information. And we would also like you to consider supporting Pellis um, and enjoying a walk outdoors um, with the Kilt Walk. Um, Edinburgh Kilt Walk is still uh, to happen on the 18th of September and there's also the virtual walk, um, which is the 7th to the 9th of October. Um, 
I'll put, uh, or I think Jenny has put a link in the chat to complete our survey. So if you complete our survey, there will be um, a free giveaway and it's something to help with your jam making. So thank you um, again, everybody. And we'll see you in the 29th, hopefully. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye. Bye. bye.